Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we look to help you with your Gospel Doctrine class. Today we are on Lesson 32 of the Old Testament. This is the book of Job, but it's also called, I Know That My Redeemer Liveth. Uh, the book of Job is an interesting book because we don't know when exactly it was written. We don't know who the author of the book is. We don't even know if Job is a real person who lived. If he did live, if he was real, we know he lived in the East. And we know that he probably wasn't an Israelite. And that's about all we know. Um, it's possible that many different authors inserted certain things as the book got developed. Um, we're not entirely sure. But we do know that it's referenced in the New Testament. Job is referenced also in uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 121. I believe it's verse 10 where Christ says to Joseph Smith, Thou art not yet as Job. So specifically referring to Job. Some people want to argue that stuff. I don't think it's worth our time or effort. What is important about Job is that there is a message, a few messages that we can get from the text. And so we ought to spend our time learning about those important concepts that God wants us to understand. So when you teach this lesson, I would start, and you really want to focus on at least chapters 1 and 2. There's some other verses that I'll touch upon, but most of it is found in in chapters 1 and 2. So if you've got your scriptures, I would read uh, verses 1 through 3 to get started. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So there's a lot packed into these first three verses. We should touch upon them briefly. Um, so we know that it's in the land of Uz. We have no idea where that is, by the way. Um, his name was Job, so we got a name of this guy. We know that he was perfect and upright. So what does perfect mean? Well, in Greek, uh, the word, when, when Christ said, be therefore perfect, uh, the word is teleos. Teleos, Neil A. Maxwell said, was the word complete. So to be a complete person rather than a perfect person. To be as good as you can be in the situation that you find yourself in. Um, so that's one idea, one concept. What does it mean to be upright? Well, to be righteous, to keep the commandments, to follow Christ. And one that feared God and eschewed evil. I've talked in a previous episode about how fear, there's three different types of fear. Um, and when we're talking about this fear, it's more honor and respect. Because we fear God, we're going to do what he asks us to do. And eschews evil, meaning casts out evil, stays away from evil, keep evil away from you. So that's the way he was. And so a question you might want to ask when you're teaching this lesson is, how can we be like Job? What is Job like here and how can we do that? How can we acquire uh, these virtues? And then you can talk about his posterity. He had seven uh, boys and three girls. Now remember, in ancient Israelite culture, it was considered um, shame and, and a curse from God to be barren or without kids. Here he had several kids, right? And it was, at least back in that time, more favorable to have boys than girls. He had seven boys. Obviously, he's a blessed man. And then he had plenty of substance, wealth. He had um, all these animals. Remember, 500 yoke of oxen means there was actually a 1,000 oxen because a yoke, there would be two oxen in the yoke. So we've got that, and then we've got this interesting story that happens after it sets forth who Job is. If you read verses 6 to 12, and, and I think we ought to do that to set the stage. Um, now, this is verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, I want to pause right here to just mention that this is a setting of a divine council. And we'd see this back in um, Genesis, right, when the world was first created. There's a divine council, and we have Satan coming to them. <coughs> Excuse me. And Satan has a proposal. 
And verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and saith, and said, Doth Job, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is an increase in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So what we have here is basically Satan saying, you know what? The only reason Job uh, is being righteous and obedient is because he's prospering. He's doing great. He's got all these kids. He's got all this material wealth. If he didn't have that stuff, he would curse you. And so almost as a challenge, right? Uh, the Lord says, go ahead, do it, right? Go ahead, don't kill him, but you can do everything else but that. And so what we see is, what we see is, is something different than we're really used to. In our minds and, and probably in the way God works and the way we like to think about him is he is merciful, he is gracious, he uh, would not do anything to harm another person, right? God is not like that. He wouldn't say, um, right, if, if he's all good and all goodness is in him and he is love, right, as John said, then why is it that this righteous man is going to have these bad things happen. And, and if you continue on, and you should in your lesson, read verses 13 uh, through uh, three, thirteen through 19, and that explains how all the bad things start happening, right? He loses his family, loses all his wealth. And uh, I want to refer you to uh, section 121, because in that, um, there's a part, uh, let's see here, where it talks about compulsory means, right? DNC 121.46, the Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion. And without compulsory means, it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. And I might have mentioned this before. It is without compulsory means that God governs us here on the earth. No one is forced or compelled to do anything. God is very benign in this sense. He lets us live our lives. And remember in the book of Abraham, it says, We will prove them now herewith to see whether they will do all things which the Lord their God shall command them. So we're being tested here on earth. We're being proven. But that doesn't mean that God is going to prevent all bad things from happening to good people. In fact, Bad things will happen to good people. And this is part of how God governs this creation. It's by letting us do what things we need to do. When, when God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he did not babysit them. He did not watch over them specifically to make sure they never made a mistake or to make sure they would not sin. He let them live their lives. And so he does the same with us. He lets us live. Whether we choose to follow him or not is completely up to us. Without that agency, without that ability to make those decisions, there would be no existence. We would not exist. Existence for us would cease. That is why we have to be independent in our own ability to choose to follow God and keep his commandments. Well, that's a small aside. But needless to say, um, there is something important in the exchange that happens between Satan and the council. First, you need to know that Satan, the word Satan is ha-satan in uh, Hebrew, and it, it does a, appear a few times in the Bible, and that word Satan literally means in Hebrew, accuser. And I want to bring this up because accuser is exactly what Satan does. It's one of his titles. And if you'll come with me, to uh, Revelations, the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 10. 
And this, of course, is the last book in the Bible. It's the vision that John had on the island of Patmos. But we have another instance here where he talks about Satan. And this is uh, chapter 12 of Revelations, verse 10. He says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Accuser of the brethren. That is another title of Satan. So you see, he accuses, he points the finger, he serves as someone trying to condemn others. Okay, so whenever you accuse someone, you are acting the role of Satan. You are doing what he would do, which is trying to condemn another or punish another. So accuser of our brethren. I want to point out that Joseph Smith spoke about this. Um, it's uh, found, you can look at doc, uh, Documentary History of the Church, Volume 4, page 445. It's also found in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 193. And I'm going to do the one in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. I have that here. And I want you to pay very close attention to what Joseph teaches us about being an accuser and how accusing others uh, is something that we need to know about. All right, this is what he says. I charge the saints not to follow the example of the adversary in accusing the brethren and said, if you do not accuse each other, God will not accuse you. If you have no accuser, you will enter heaven. And if you will follow the revelations and instructions which God gives you through me, I will take you into heaven as my backload. If you will not accuse me, I will not accuse you. If you will throw a cloak of charity over my sins, I will over yours. For charity covereth a multitude of sins. Think about those words for a minute. Don't be like the adversary. And it's really important because if you do not accuse others, you will be found clean. You will be found repentant and humbled. And you will be able to enter into heaven if you don't accuse others because you are not going to be the adversary. Let's say someone has done something wrong and harmed you. What has Christ taught us to do in the Sermon on the Mount? If someone wants to sue you at the law, give them your coat, right? If they sue you again, give them your cloak also, right? Give what they ask of you, even if it's unjust. Why is that? This concept is really important to understand because you may have just claims against another, but if you lay those just claims down and you decide not to accuse others and you lay them down, Christ will do the same for you. You don't want to be an accuser. Now, when it says accuser of the brethren, brethren, sometimes we hear that and we think to ourselves, oh, they're talking about the Quorum of the Twelve. They're talking about the First Presidency. Perhaps you extend that to your stake presidency or your bishop or your bishopric. The truth is, when you're talking about brethren, you're talking about everyone. Not only members of the church, but your neighbors, those who are not members of the church. Anyone on this earth is your neighbor and is your brother or your sister. You must lay down all of your claims, even if they're just. And by doing so and not accusing another, you will then qualify to go into heaven. That's what Joseph Smith is talking about here. Now, there's another scripture that goes about this as well, and it's found in Matthew. And I, I bring this up because you can see how uh, during Christ's time on the earth that the uh, Pharisees were taking up the role of being an accuser. One of the things that they accused Christ of more than anything else was breaking the Sabbath day, not keeping it holy. So if you come with me to Matthew, and we're going to look at um, chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. Uh, I'll read these to you, but I think these set a good example. Uh, this is Matthew 12, 10 through 13. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on Sabbath days that they might accuse him? You see what the Pharisees are doing? They're looking for a way to accuse Christ. So they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on Sabbath day? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? 
Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like the other. You see, Christ understood something, which is that although, yes, we should keep the Sabbath day holy, absolutely, there's nothing wrong in doing good on the Sabbath day, including healing someone else. And, as I mentioned before, we should not be accusing others. All right, back to Job. Job chapter 1, we talked about, um, we're going to pick it up at the very tail of chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. We've skipped over, but I think you should read them in your class, um, what happened to Job and how he lost all those things. Uh, Verse 20 says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And he said, you've heard these words before, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You see what Job is here. Job is humble. He's willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him. Because remember, we're being tested. We are being tried. So, if you want to reference at this point, Mosiah uh, chapter 3, verse 19, in King Benjamin's discourse, this is a perfect application to talk about that, how Job's example was to be humble and to be submissive to God's will. There's other lessons here that we can learn from Job as well. It's to not just submit to God's will, but to admit that God's will is just and it is correct. And we are not to judge God. We are to be judged by God. Remember, we have a veil over our eyes, the veil of flesh. We don't see what God sees. We don't know the full picture. We don't know what happened. We know details, few small details of what happened before we came here. We know very few small details of what will happen after here. But as Joseph Smith said, until you gaze into heaven, you could read everything that's ever been written on the subject and you won't have any idea. Because you simply just don't know. And so our job is not to judge God, it's to be judged by God. And then another lesson that we're to learn is to be blameless and to be upright. To follow Christ, to do what he wants us to do, and to not judge God. I think those are the big lessons. Now, another one that's found in James is to be uh, patient. And you can find that in James 5, verse 11. It talks about the patience of Job. All right, and then the next thing would be chapter 2. Oh, before I go there, there's a couple other scriptures I'd reference you to. Job being humble, you could look at Luke 14, verse 11. You could also look at Luke 18, 9 through 14, other examples of being humble. Okay, so next would be chapter 2, where it talks about how he's smitten with boils and all the other horrible things that happened to him. Uh, I'd read chapter 2 if you have time. And then... After you read through chapter 2, I wouldn't spend any time until you get to chapter 11. I'd skip over all that in the interest of time. Just don't have time to go over everything. There's a few verses. I would look specifically in chapter 11 at 4 to 13. I'll read those with you because they are fantastic, and I think they have great um, doctrinal implications, things you can talk about in class, great, great discussion points. It says, For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. But, oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know, therefore, that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? It's a great question. Ask it to your class. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain men would rise, would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. If thou prepare thine heart, and stretch out thine hands toward him. If iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. 
I mean, that is just some profound language here. Um, I would reference you to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 for more discussion point. And also lectures on faith, um, lecture 3, verse 7. You see, Joseph Smith talked about this as well. He talked about um, how the things of God are of deep import. He said, and, and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts could only find them out. He said your mind had to stretch as high as the utmost heavens and search into and contemplate the darkest abyss and the broad expanse of eternity. He said we must commune with God. You must commune with God. I must commune with God. All of us we need to have a relationship with God. We need to know Him. Interesting, it says you have to prepare thine heart. We've talked about Alma 12, 9 through 11 before. That's another verse that you can bring up here when you talk about your heart. Your heart has to be right with God. And it says, stretch out thine hands toward Him. When we reach up to God, He reaches down to us. Uh, so those are some other things to consider. And you could read that whole chapter. That's great. And then the rest of Job, all the way to the end, the last chapter is 42. And that's all um, things that go back and forth between three of uh, Job's friends and Job himself. There's discussions. There's very, very deep discussions that go back and forth. And a lot of it is poetry. And it's it's beautiful. And it's a great discussion point. And, and through it all, even Job's wife said, you ought to just, you know, curse God, and, and Job refuses to do it. So to end up the end of class, you want to end up in chapter 42. You could read it all. There's some great parts to it, how uh, Job has a discussion with the Lord. Uh, verse 8, he talks about taking up a burnt offering, and Job shall pray for you. But the greatest verses are at the end. It's verses 10 through 17 at the tail end. It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You see, at the end of his trial, he got twice as much as he had before. In verse 11, in the middle, it says, And comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. So, even though he went through this horrible trial, this terrible ordeal, he was comforted it. How does the Lord comfort us? I looked at John 14, if you want a discussion about that. I've talked about that before when we looked at Proverbs, but... The comfort of the Lord has a very specific meaning, and it, it involves the Lord's personal ministration to the person. And then verse 16, after this, lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. So I would focus on that. I would focus on what we can learn from Job. Job teaches us some very good principles, teaches us not just patience, but to endure hardships. We should avoid being the accuser. And finally, no matter what happens to us, we need to not curse God and blame him and say, that's a horrible lot I just got dealt with. But we rather should be humble and we should accept whatever he gives to us. That's the lesson of Job. And that's the lesson I hope you use in your class. I hope you found this um, Gospel Doctrine Helps class helpful today. And if you have, uh, definitely like the video. If you want to, leave a comment in the section below. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you for watching.